The real true first lady in the Bible, of course, is Eve. In Hebrew, Chava is the mother of all life. Uh, however, when we talk about Abraham being our first father, first patriarch, so in that context, you can say Sarah is the first lady. So as always, there are nuances. But the bottom line is, let's talk about this. Now, I have to also make another qualification. As you can tell, I'm a man. And at the end of the day, there's a certain lack of total credibility when a man talks about feminine, feminine mystique. It's like that joke they tell. A guy asks a woman and says, um, what do you, th the, the, the joke they tell, I should repeat that. Um, a woman asks a man, what do you think about uh, feminine woman's intuition? And he says a bunch of hogwash. He said, how did I know you were going to say that? So, yet, I'm not coming just from my own experience or perspective, though I've had great, wonderful women around me in my life, but also from the deeper mystical and spiritual perspective of the feminine archetype. And though, yes, there a woman would probably be much more fitting to talk about this, but I want to share a few thoughts which may be meaningful to all of us. Now, gender issues in general, masculine and feminine, have been, especially lately, in the news and headlines. We're not really going to address that. But there's no question that there's a crisis and a challenge in identity in general, especially gender and sexual identity. That's why it's very good to often go back to the roots. And the Bible does teach us things that are surprisingly timely and extremely relevant to the 21st century despite the stereotype that one would think that these are archaic ideas. So we're going to talk about Sarah. Sarah and Abraham are the two pioneers, partners, that forged a new path, a path that was not driven by self-interest, but by the greater good. And not that, not that they were pushovers, not that they forgot about their own needs, but they dedicated their lives to create a new way of looking at the world. Instead of being about my interests and myself and my needs first, they had an open home. Not only an open home, they went out, reached out to people, inspired them spiritually. As we're told in so many different ways, their chesed, their kindness was legendary. But remember, they were the pioneers. It wasn't something that was a given and everybody was doing it. They were pioneers. As I discussed in the last program about Abraham, the first pioneer. But Sarah was the equal partner. So what do we learn about not just their general partnership, but Sarah's particular touch that we can learn about that, that teaches us so much today? So there's a fascinating episode in the Bible that after Sarah passes away, interestingly, it's after she passes away, we learn virtues about her that we didn't even know about before that. They were there, but they became far more apparent, which itself is a tremendous lesson in life that I just would like to stop and pause on for a moment. That if you really want to see someone's eternal contribution, it's not always when you see it in their lifetime, because in their lifetime, they're present. So obviously, they're having their influences. Do you know when you really see it? When they're physically no longer here. Are they remembered? Is there a legacy? I'm speaking now to you almost 4,000 years later, 3,800 years since Sarah lived. And there's an, indeed a chapter called The Life of Sarah. What it actually talks about is life after her passing, because that's when you suddenly see, more than ever, the real impact. As I said, when the light is shining, the light is shining, but when the light is dimmed, where you don't see the person's light, are they still affecting generations to come? And, the, and she did indeed. And here's the story. So after she passes away, Abraham determines it's time for Isaac to find Isaac a bride. He sends a servant who goes out and finds Rebekah. Rebekah finally meets Isaac. Long story, but they come together. And here's their first encounter. Well, you see, you talk about love at first sight, but not in the Hollywood 
superficial style. We're talking about a love that would last not just in their lifetime, but thousands of years. Many people say they fall in love. Two years later, they're fighting an ugly divorce divorce war in court. They meet. Isaac brings her into the tent. They lived in tents. Into Sarah's tent. And he sees that it's like his mother reappearing. Now, most of us don't want to marry someone like our mother. But when you know who Sarah was, the ultimate paragon of a woman. But what did he see? So interestingly, he sees four features in her. Actually, Rashi, the commentary, brings three of the four. But the Medrash, which is a commentary on the verse, says he brings four things. What are the four things? The first, he sees a cloud hovering over the tent, which had disappeared after his mother passed away. The second thing, he sees a flame burning from Friday to Friday, all week. The third, he sees a blessing in her dough. That's the expression, in the food she prepared. And the fourth thing, he sees that the doors of the tent are open and welcoming to everyone, whoever wants to come from any direction. That's the fourth one Rashi does not cite. But those are the four. Now, when you think about it, it sounds, okay, nice, a little poetic, romantic. But no, they signify four tremendous features in the feminine mystique that if we were able to somewhat bottle it into a formula, we would have a very different world. Now, many of you may already be following these guidelines, but it's worthwhile describing them. So what do these four signify? The cloud, the flame, the blessing in the dough, and the four-sided, the doors open on all di- in all directions. It signifies the four most important features in a human being in general, and especially in a woman. The cloud. You can go into a home, and the home may be a beautiful home, beautiful furniture, curtains, paintings, a mansion, in every possible way. But it could be a cold home. It could be a home where you don't feel an aura. You don't feel a cloud. You don't feel a vibe in modern lingo. I remember someone telling me, someone grew up in Europe, very aristocratic and wealthy home. Her father had owned it in a small island in, the Greek, in Greece. They would go boating half, half a year. I mean, lived a life of complete luxury. But I remember once when she said to me, with tears in her eyes, it was the most glorious home, but there was no one there. I was there with a few nannies. My parents, who were not even talking to each other, barely came home. It was a house without love. And the first thing that came to mind, I said to her, you know, Sarah had a cloud in her tent. I don't know how luxurious it was, but there was a cloud. The cloud represents a hovering presence. The mystics explain that in life we need two things. We need what is called internal energy, and we need what is called transcendent energy. Internal energy is like when you eat and drink, you need to digest food to sustain you. Clothing, on the other hand, is important, but it surrounds you. And a home is even more so. It's called in the Kabbalistic terms, makif. It's a transcendent energy. And it's hard to put your finger on it. As I said, you can have a beautiful home, you can have beautiful clothing, you can have beautiful furniture. But then there's the aura in the home. And when Isaac saw, after his mother passed away, that aura had dissipated, and he saw it return. Rebecca, Rivka. That's number one. The second thing was the flame that burned from week from Friday to Friday. So, of course, right away reminds us of lighting the fire, the Ner Shabbat, the candle that we light before Shabbat, before holidays, Friday to Friday. But here the key thing is that it burned all week. It didn't just burn for a few hours. What does that symbolize? So let's talk about light. What is light? Light is an interesting entity. Einstein made it very popular in the world of science. But if you look in the world of Kabbalah, you see light is always used. Or in Sof, the infinite light, the infinite energy. So light is more than just turning on a light and seeing things. Light is actually quite paradoxical. On one hand, it clearly is visible. 
On the other hand, it doesn't have any substance. But think of this property. A little light dispels a lot of darkness. All the weapons in the world cannot eliminate darkness. A little flame comes into the picture and eliminates darkness without any battle. When it comes to water and fire, enough water can evaporate large bodies. Enough water can, uh, can, can extinguish a large fire. Enough, enough fire can evaporate large body of water. And they struggle, they battle. They're equal adversarial forces. When it comes to light and darkness, as soon as a little light enters into the darkest room, that area will be illuminated. You may need more light to illuminate a darker space, a, a larger dark space. But light doesn't have any battle going on. Indeed, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes compares it to wisdom. He says, wisdom dominates over folly, over nonsense. A wise person over a foolish person, like light over darkness. It does, there's no battle. The battle is only when there is no light. Darkness, then, is the absence of light. What, how does that, what is it relevant in our case? Ushering in the Shabbat, ushering in that sacred day, that oasis in a busy world, especially in a world like ours, requires something far deeper, far more subtle than all the weapons and all the instruments and all the gadgets that we have. All it is lighting a little flame. And what he saw by his mother and then by Rebecca it returned, he saw she didn't just light a flame, but a flame burned all the time. Imagine being in a home where even when darkness enters, there's pain, suffering, all the things symbolized by darkness. Even when we have setbacks or we have dark moments of despair, whether it's, whether it's man-made or whether it's, it just comes our way from above, whether it's abuse, whether it's trauma, other losses, insecurities, fears, all associated with darkness, there's always a little flame burning, a pilot flame. Always, from Friday to Friday. Why only from Friday? Why not just say forever? Because it gets renewed every week. It's not just the same thing. But it's always there. Imagine having a mother, a spouse, a wife, where you know no matter what happens, the flame is always burning. There'll always be a smile. There'll always be hope. And there'll always be that power that doesn't battle. It doesn't require battle. It's very gentle. It's not like aggressive masculine energy. It's part of the feminine mystique. So in addition to the aura of the cloud, he saw now this flame that automatically dispelled darkness. And that reassured him the confidence that he knew that here he has a woman that will be a, a appropriate, part, not just partner, maybe in many ways leader even, and she could have those powers. Those are two. The third is the blessing in the food. It's called actually the blessing in the dough. So we know there's the mitzvah of challah. Challah. Challah is a mitzvah, which means that when you bake a piece of bread or you break a, a challah, a piece of the dough you put aside. You sanctify it. And that creates a blessing in the food that you eat. Now, we all eat food. We all need to eat and drink. But how much do we associate with it? How much so sanctity do we associate? We eat when we're hungry. Sit down. It may be a beautiful meal with family. Sometimes it's a real time to bond, to connect. But the meal itself, a human body needs fuel, so we eat. I'm not even getting into eating in a gluttonous or indulgent fashion. But imagine you also, your meal is also a, an offering. And your table is an altar. You sanctify your food. We don't think about it usually. We think of san sanctity and transcendence usually in context of holy things, whether it's a holiday or it's a prayer service or it's a house of worship or it's a temple. No, even in the mundane things, just a piece of dough, piece of food, which symbolizes all food, is sanctified. And he saw that in the dough of Rebecca similar to what he found in his mother. And finally, the fourth thing, the graciousness. Graciousness. That no matter what direction a person comes, not just east, west, south, or north, but also what direction, meaning what, wherever they are, what a kind of personality they have, whether they're coming from a direction that you completely don't identify with, or one that you do identify with, or one from left field, that there's no judgment. Everybody is welcome. 
because you're a soulful person. And the word soulful is the key here because all four elements that I described are all soulfulness. It's soulfulness in the aura of the home. It's soulfulness in the light and the spirituality and the soul which is compared to a flame. The soul of a human being, being is, the, is, the divine, is a divine flame that dispels darkness automatically. The soulfulness, even in material activities like eating a meal, the dough, and the soulfulness in how we greet, re- greet people and how we welcome people. All these four different features, all were under that rubric called the soul. And indeed, the feminine mystique is about soul, introducing soul into a relationship into a marriage, into a commitment. It's not just a negotiated contract where we both take care of each other. It's not just sexuality, companionship. All of that is correct. But there's also a soulfulness, a transcendent soulfulness. And this brings me to an interesting thing. And maybe this is why Rashi only brings the first three of the four. The first three are also an acronym for the word hachem, which means the grace. Or Chana, another Hebrew name. Chala, Nida, and Adlokot Nerat. Sanctity in the three pillars of a true, healthy marriage and relationship. One is sanctity in our intimacy. Not just sexuality, intimacy. It's a connection between two people that are bonded, and they're intimate not only when they're physically together, they're intimate all the time. That's the aura of the cloud. The second is the sanctity within within their time, in space, in time and time itself, the time of Shabbat, sanctifying the light by the candle that sanctifies space and time. And finally, the sanctity that comes and the soulfulness that comes in the very food that we consume, in the material things that we're involved in. But the fourth is equally valuable and equally important, and that is the graciousness, the welcoming, how we treat people, how we're always giving and we're always open and what's fascinating here is also to remember, this wasn't just he was looking for a carbon copy of his mother, Sarah. She was a very strong and powerful individual, Rebecca. She had her own challenges. And yet she came out like a rose among thorns, very powerful person. And as such, she was her own unique self. But the features, the features are eternal. The features are ones that we can look at thousands of years later and say, Do we have that in our lives? Do we have that soulfulness in relationships? Because that's the main thing that's missing. You know, in a relationship, I've given many relationship workshops, and we always talk about compatibility, compatibility, physical compatibility, sexual compatibility. We talk about emotional compatibility, intellectual compatibility. And you think if you have those three, what else is, what's missing? But all those three are subject to change. The fourth compatibility, which which was introduced here, in the story of Sarah, is the spiritual compatibility. Do you share a vision with another? What kind of home do you want to build? What kind of children do you want to bring in this world? What kind of mark do you want to make in the universe? When someone comes into your home, how would you like them to feel? How would you like them to go? What do you want them to go away with? In other words, the eternal things in life, the eternal values. Now, in the world in which we live, we have so many comforts, such ease, press a button, you get something within a half an hour. We often lose sight and become desensitized to the soulfulness of these four features of Sarah, which is the true power of the feminine. Now, men, masculine, also have feminine aspects to them. They also have soulfulness. However, in some ways, maybe it is because simply because a man is physically stronger, it sometimes can obfuscate his more spiritual nature. And women, generally speaking, tend to have that more revealed. But we live in a world where many women think that they have to play by man's game and by the man's rules, which is very sad because the way the Kabbalists and the mystics put it is that we're really looking to create a feminine universe where the masculine is a means to help help tame the aggression of this world. But the goal is to reveal the feminine energy, which is the soulfulness of Sarah. And that's the true feminine mystique. That is the true quintessential woman. And it's beautiful in its own right. It's the intimate energy within, not the expressive one. As much as we speak and as much as we express ourselves, and that's critically important, 
There are things that can never really be spoken. And that's ultimately what, what Isaac recognized in his mother and then in the next generation, Rebecca. So the first lady was the first lady, not just as the first ladies in our White House in the United States or other first ladies. This was the first real lady. Now, Chava, this is not in any way a slight to her because she embodied these qualities as well, as is sp- spoken about. But we're putting it in the context of the two the leaders, Abraham and Sarah, as they pioneered the path of bringing virtue and justice into what can be a hostile dark universe. And I mentioned specifically hostile dark universe because these features are what we give, are the tools that we have that can counter any darkness, the aura and the intimacy of the cloud, the light and the flame of the flame, of the eternal flame, I should say. The spirituality within matter, within the mundane, within materialism, the blessing and the dough, and the graciousness to all people from every possible direction. I hope I did a little justice to this great lady called Sarah, and I hope we all can learn lessons from her all of us, in making our world a more gentler, kinder place and turning our world into a garden, not just into a shelter, but into a garden, a beautiful garden. This has been Simon Jacobson, our new series called Biblical Characters Decoded, Lessons in Life. We're talking about Sarah, the first lady in the Bible. Please go to MeaningfulLife.com. That's our website where you can find a schedule of the upcoming events and programs, topics, you name it, from A to Z. Check it out. If you like the ideas, please share them with others. It's all about sharing. And we'd love to hear your feedback, your comments, your thoughts, your suggestions. Thank you so much, and be blessed.